Welcome to another edition of RCE. Again, this is Brock Palin. You can find us online, subscribe, and find the entire back catalog of over 100 episodes on research computing at rce-cast.com. I have again with me Jeff Squires of Cisco Systems and one of the authors of OpenMPI. Jeff, thanks again for your time. Hey, Brock. It's getting to be, well, I guess we're hitting mid to late spring here. Um, and that seems like a perfect time to me to talk about electrodynamics, don't you think? <laughs> of course. It's always a good yeah. time to talk about that. So we have with us uh, some of the team that's behind uh, Meet. Um, guys, why don't you take a moment to introduce yourself? I'm uh, Stephen Johnson. I'm a professor of applied math and physics at MIT. I'm Ardavan Oskui. I was formerly a student here at MIT with Professor Johnson and currently leading a startup out of San Francisco commercializing Meet. Called Sympetus. Okay, so can you give us a background on what MEEP slash Sympetus, I think is Sympetus? Sympetus, okay. yeah. Sympetus, uh, you know, what is it? So MEEP is uh, a program to simulate Maxwell's equations, the equations of electromagnetism. And there are lots and lots of methods, uh, computational methods for electromagnetism. Uh, so MEEP uh, it, 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 uh, uses one of the most general and basic methods called the finite difference time domain method. So it just discretizes space and marches Maxwell's equations forward in time. And so because of, because of that, it's handling the full time-dependent Maxwell's equations. It can s include lots of different kinds of physics. And it's a you know, very general code uh, with the, with the trade-off that it's not as efficient as maybe as some more specialized code that only solve one small class of problems. So, Dr. Johnson, you were on this show before uh, about FFTW, which is probably what you're best known for. Um, there's a relationship between FFTW and MEEP, isn't there? Uh, very tenuous. Uh, so, FFTW is actually used uh, for another electromagnetic simulation code that I developed called MPB, which it, it, uh, is less general than MEEP, it, it, but it, it only solves one kind of problem. It finds the like harmonic modes or resonant modes of Maxwell's equations, and that uses Fourier transforms and, and, and uh, a Fourier transform basis, and so it uses FFW. And in fact, FFW was developed in part for MEEP. So MEEP uh, solves a more general class of problems, and so it doesn't use Fourier transforms directly, but it it, can, it actually can call MPB. For, for part of its features, and, and then MPB calls f w So there is a connection, but it's sort of a little bit indirect. Ah, okay. So, but MEEP is actually an acronym, right? What does MEEP stand for? So I think it originally stood for uh, um, MIT Electromagnetic Equation Propagation. We've, we've invented lots of other meanings for the acronym, like Maxwell's Equations for Every Person and uh, other things like that. But like most acronyms, mostly people forget what it stands for, and they just call it MEEP. Okay, so you talked about Maxwell's equations and whatnot, but break it down for those of us who are, are not deep into the science here. What kind of physical phenomenon does this simulate? I mean, what, how would I explain this to, say, my mother? So, you know, Maxwell's equations is all electricity and magnetism, like circuits, and also light and optics are electromagnetic waves, and all sorts of things like plasmas and other kinds of things can fall into this category as well. Uh, so, uh, mainly MEEP is oriented towards modeling wave propagation problems. So problems, uh, like I said, in optics, modeling, uh, you know, lasers, modeling sensors, um, uh, you know, modeling all, all sorts of like optical fibers and filters and other kinds of, uh, you know, phenomena that are, you know, also microwave effects. So in principle, you can you can model microwaves, and microwave devices, and other kinds of things. But mostly, I think most of the people using MEEP are using it for optical and infrared simulations. So how would that those types of simulations map into like a real world uh, product and what people actually use? Uh, I can give a few examples here. Um, one. Uh, kind of emerging area of display applications you guys might have heard of are organic LEDs. Uh, they are recently been introduced by Apple in the latest generation iPhone uh, X, but also increasingly uh, prevalent in solid state lighting applications. 
And one of the big challenges in organic LEDs is much of the light that's generated by these organic molecules actually remains confined within the device. And so there's a lot of research within companies such as Samsung, um, LG, uh, Nichia, a Japanese company, to design structures that can extract the light and to increase the energy efficiency of these organic LED devices. And so that's one application that involves quite a bit of uh, optical simulations based on uh, finite difference time domain tools such as MEEP uh, and other solvers. Other applications involving uh, photonics uh, involve um, integrated circuit applications for data centers. Uh, and so many of the listeners of this podcast uh, may be familiar with uh, oh. bottlenecks related to data transfer within large data centers. And there's been a lot of talk recently into transitioning from a kind of an op, uh, copper interconnect technology to a, a light-based optical fiber technology. And at the core of that are essentially optical circuits that can convert electrons into photons. And those involve quite a bit of optical design and uh, simulation tools such as MEEP and others. Yeah, so get, getting light onto a chip from an optical fiber and into a circuit and off and back off. Also, solar cells, like you know, the, if, if you're, you're, tr you're trying to make a solar cell more efficient, very often what you do nowadays is you, you take a thin th solar cell layer and you texture it or you put microstructures on it to, to scatter the light and make it absorb more efficiently. And to design that, you need uh, lots and lots of simulations. So who are, you know, who uses this software? So you mentioned a bunch of brand names in there. Um, and I work for a very large uh, networking company too, Cisco. Um, you know, do we use these things to develop our hardware? Because forgive me, I actually, I, I don't know because I'm a software guy. So I don't work down much lower at the hardware certies level. Well, I can say pretty much with high confidence that most large corporations developing display applications or uh, sensors involving light, and as Stephen mentioned, solar cells, all of them using uh, electromagnetic simulation tools really at the core of their design. Um, and more recently, there are applications involving augmented reality. Uh, you may be following kind of developments in Google Glass and its successor, Daydream, Oculus for virtual reality. All of these have involved really intensive research into kind of next generation display technologies. And those involve lots and lots of optical simulations as well. Yeah. And now th there are lots of simulation methods and lots of simulation software out there. So it's, it's, sometimes it can be a little hard to track down who is using what. Uh, so for example, MEEP is a time domain simulation. Uh, and, and there are actually several, it, it, MEEP is completely open source free software, but there are also closed source proprietary uh, yeah, simulation packages that use similar algorithms from a whole bunch of companies. Uh, and so, you know, d d and, and different people are using different software. So initially, I think MEEP, MEEP's initial foothold was more in the research world where, you know, it, when you're doing research and you're pushing the, the edge of uh, uh, of what's possible with optics, you, you often need to be able to get inside the code and really change what's happening, and that's only possible with an open source tool. Uh, but you know, now Artivan's company is working much more with a lot of different uh, commercial uh, commercial vendors that are starting to use this kind of thing. So you've talked a lot about the organic LEDs, which you know, for things like displays, you want to be in the visible range. You also mentioned, um, uh, I think it was infrared. Um, what about extreme parts of the spectrum? Is, is this code completely generalizable? Like, could I use it for extremely high frequency, like almost like radio, like, like radio type frequencies? Well, radio is not high, it's actually low. It's but low. Yeah. yeah, I got that backwards. But um, like, yeah, you know, is, it, is it purely generalizable or do you kind of assume you want to stay and we're focused on this? optical range, you know, from inner infrared, to, you know, to each side of optic, you know, visible, but you kind of want to stay in that range. No, it, it can work for everything from radio frequencies to x-rays. Uh, you know, as a theorist, I usually work in dimensionless units. I said my wavelength is always one. Uh, so, you know, in some sense, uh, the theory is the same whether radio frequencies or at x-rays. The difference is the materials. So at, at really, uh, at long wavelengths, uh, you know, microwaves and radio frequencies, 
um, you know, where you have really, really good conductors, the like metals is really high, uh, then, you know, you, you can still use this code, but sometimes there are other methods that take advantage uh, 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 of that, that really high connectivity to be, be able to be more efficient from metallic structures. Um, at, uh, at really short wavelengths, uh, in some sense, once you get to start getting to X-rays, it, it almost becomes uh, MEEP is, is overkill because at X-rays, uh, almost everything is transparent, as you know. That's why they use X-rays to look through you. Uh, so there isn't as much to do in terms of doing scattering calculation. MEEP, MEEP can certainly handle it, but it's it's like if, if you're mostly modeling light propagation through empty space, it's overkill to use a big simulation for that. Uh, so you know many of the most interesting the reason the reason I, I mention uh, 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 you know most people are using it for infrared and optical frequencies is that that's where most of the interesting photonics design is going on at this space. It if you're at microwave frequencies, if you're at radio if you're really long wavelengths, hundred kilometer wavelengths for, for radio waves, then you're, you're doing circuits. Right, so I mean, and it's overkill to do the full Maxwell's equations for a circuit. Well, and if you're at microwave, if you want to trap, if you want to tr make a waveguide at microwave, if you want to send light along a channel, you just make a metal tube. You don't need a complicated geometry. And again, if, if, at the other end of the spectrum, if you're at X-ray, there's really not much to do with optical design because it goes through just about everything. So the the interesting part is optical and infrared, and that's that's why people need lots of simulation tools there. So you mentioned uh, um, MPB, you know, MIT Photonic Bands, which was another code you had done. And you mentioned that um, MEEP is able to call MPB, but you said that MEEP is more generalizable. So what what does MPB do that you'd still want to call it versus just using MEEP? Why would you want to choose one package or the other? So... You know, usually, and this is in all of scientific computation, there's a trade-off between generality and performance you know, if, it, 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 and ease of use. So if you have something that just does one kind of calculation, it can be very fast and very easy to use for that thing. So MPB is one of those things that just does one thing. It just computes what are called the modes, uh, the harmonic modes of a structure. So if you have a waveguide, an optical channel, it will very efficiently compute you know what those modes are, what the field patterns are that just propagate down that wave uh, that wave guided fixed frequency. So, so uh, MEEP is much more general. It, it can have uh, things that don't really have modes. They have, have nonlinearities, or things are moving around in time, so the frequency is changing. It gets extremely powerful in general. But the trade-off is that if you just want to compute the modes of an optical fiber. You can do it with MEEP, but it'll be slower and a little bit more annoying to use than something that's specialized for just that problem. And so the reason that MEEP calls MPB is very often, if you're doing a calculation, for example, you're coupling, you're trying to couple an optical fiber into a chip. And so you want to start off the simulation by sending in one of the modes of those fibers. So your initial condition, in some sense, your source is one of the modes of those fibers. And so what MEEP will do is it'll call MPB to compute that mode and use it as the source. And so it, 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 MPB will tell it, oh, this is the fundamental mode of that optical fiber. And, uh, and then MEEP will use that information and launch that mode in into the chip and then you'll see what it does. The, the mode comes in and it bounces around or it gets converted into something else and so forth. And MEEP will, will do all of those dynamics. Now, one of the obvious challenges that we have in, in lots of scientific computing is that, uh, you know, on a single server, you can do so much. And so, you know, typical solutions to this are, you know, the, the typical MPI types of solutions. Does, does MEEP support MPI? Do you guys scale up that way? Yes. Yes. So, in fact, one of the things that Art Events company does is, is, is help with people do that <clears> feeling like by running MEEP on, the on like an Amazon cloud server. Okay, so what's your what's the biggest scale that you guys have done, or or I guess maybe a better question would be what is a typical scale that your customers run on? Well, let me give some context to this, which is the the range and the size of the problems that uh, meet calculations uh, involve can be huge. We're talking from you can run calculations on your desktop, kind of with a few cores, all the way to uh, hundreds of cores, or perhaps even thousands of cores, and so that range and then the computational needs 
um, really demand uh, and kind of inspired us to kind of start this company, uh, a scalable resource like a public cloud infrastructure where you can on demand access a scalable resource that's sized just for the applications of interest. And so particularly for a small startup or a small team that can't afford to build their own local cluster and maintain it, having access to uh, an Amazon cloud or a Google cloud infrastructure really enables them to leverage Meet and other open source tools in ways that would be very difficult uh, if these tools were not available. So how well, so I, that sounds exactly uh, in line with my expectations of, you know, using Amazon and Google for their infrastructure, one that is perfect for exactly this. But there have been some traditional challenges um, doing HPC in the cloud, such as the data transfer on and off and the lack of high speed networking in the cloud. How do you guys uh, address that? Well, the applications that uh, tickle, we've been looking at uh, recently haven't been pushing the li the limits of the uh, interconnect capabilities of these resources yet. Uh, so bottlenecks or communications bottlenecks yet, of course they are there. And uh, it's just that the applications that we've been using uh, have been fairly well uh, constrained, uh, I would say. Um, but certainly I would say that, uh, and of course, having a dedicated HPC infrastructure for these kinds of calculations would, would obviously be uh, important for performance reasons. Yeah, and of course, so some of the big calculations we do, you, you get time on a traditional supercomputer as well. Um, you know, a, a lot of the time you, you're running simulations on a few cores uh, that can even fit on a single machine. And then you're, you, you, if you need lots and lots of cores, it's often because you're doing parameter sweeps or some kind of optimization where you have lots of, optim lots of things that are embarrassingly parallel that don't even need to talk to one another. Uh, so then you, you just need to run a thousand instances of them. Um, so, um, but it, you know, it's, it's a, and usually in sort of day-to-day -day design work, people are typically doing relatively small simulations, and then every once in a while, when they've got sort of everything working, they put everything together and then throw it at a huge machine with you know hundreds or thousands of cores. Okay, you actually answered my question. I was going to ask if you could actually optimize around the fact for total time to solution, because you do have the ability to sweep over frequency and maybe actually subdivide ways where you're not as worried about getting a single large one done quickly when you're more interested maybe across a, a range of frequencies or a range of time or something like that where you could actually subdivide. So it, it, it sounds like you're already doing that. But uh, so, so so first of all, MEEP is, is a time domain code, so you're not putting in a single frequency. So it, it actually automatically gives you – so, so if you want multiple frequencies, you put in a pulse in time, and then you Fourier transform the result. And it gives you all the frequencies in one simulation. That's actually one of the big advantages of doing a tiny domain simulation in cases like solar cells, for example, where you're really interested in a broad bandwidth, you know, the whole the whole visible spectrum and more. Um, you can get that entire bandwidth in one simulation. Um, you also can't parallelize over time because this is the, the the time dimension is serial. You know, you have you have to do the earlier times before you can do the later times. So you can't you can't do those in parallel. So you can only really parallelize over. Uh, space, like you chop up space into into different into pieces, and they still have to talk to one another, or over other parameters. For example, you know, in, in engineering design, you're usually not just doing one structure. You're, you're you're looking at a whole family of structures, and you want to you know see the effect of this parameter or that that parameter, the the radius of this of this uh, waveguide or the the height of that. Of, of that other structure. And so you're doing a whole bunch of simulations in parallel. And those things par parallelize perfectly, of course. So you've mentioned a couple of different cloud providers there. Are, are you finding that the companies you're working with or the people you're working with, that they kind of drive that decision? Or are you providing a um, almost like, a hey, for the type of simulation you want to do, we find this to work better over here? What's What's kind of driving that decision about who, you know, like which different provider to choose? Um, well, to be honest, we're just using Amazon at this point. Uh, we've been asked whether we uh, provide our offerings through Google Cloud or Microsoft, but we haven't yet and gone in those directions yet, only because AWS is really cheap. Uh, you guys and your listeners might be familiar with spot instances. And so this is a situation where you can rent like a multi-core virtual machine for literally pennies per hour. 
Um, and so, and the scale of Amazon's infrastructure is just so much larger than its competitors at this point, where the cost kind of considerations are really foremost among our customers at this point. And so they want really, it's more important for them to access the cheapest uh, low cost machines versus the most high performance and most specced out uh, computers. Okay. I, I was I was thinking more along the lines of if that there was a, a an interest in like they had existing data, existing infrastructure, or existing agreements, because I assume some of this work is proprietary when you're talking about working with companies. But that really hasn't come up yet with the clients you're working with. They're they're happy to trust you with Amazon. Well, people people also run it on their own machines, of course. Right. So we have yeah, that's true. You can download it, compile it. People have their own clusters, or or run it on. You know, if they have if they have their own supercomputer time, there's lots of people that, that do that. Actually, the, the that that was everyone until very recently until until Lardavan uh, started up this thing with Sympetus. So actually, when, when when did you start that up? I, I can't remember. Uh, Sympetus actually started in July of 2015, and um, it really started because we felt that we had been working on Meep for almost a decade, and we were really kind more of more than a decade. More than a decade, and and, and in fact, even before Meep, Stephen, uh, as he mentioned, was, was working on MPB, and so. We had these set of really powerful open source solvers, and we really felt that we wanted to kind of take them to the next level and to give enterprises and companies who are doing real product design access to the most cutting edge solvers that didn't have these licensing restrictions. Uh, as you know, licensing commercial simulation packages is very expensive. Uh, and for some companies, the, the, the budget for the, uh, accessing simulation software is a non-trivial fraction of their overall cost. And so the idea was, what if they could leverage the, the very best in open source software and where we could support it with uh, consulting and technical support that they could have assurance in being able to deploy these uh, tools uh, and to improve their productivity. So when a customer connects to you know the instances or, or use whatever tools that you have there on, on, on EC2, what, what exactly did they get? Do they get you know pre-canned simulations that they just supply the input, or can they write their own applications and call your routines however they wish? How how exactly does this work? Right now, what we provide is a are, are the latest versions of Meep and MPB pre-installed on Ubuntu virtual machines. And in fact, that's a free offering. Uh, and so our customers can deploy this Amazon machine image. It's, it's a virtual machine with these tools pre-installed, sized for their particular applications. And for them, they customize it. So they add on their own tools or they add on third-party uh, solvers to create some custom tool chain. And sometimes we, we provide them with technical support for that. But at this point in time, uh, the tools are free and they deploy it for their specific needs, and we just provide them with some technical support. Yeah, so just in terms of inputs, basically once you have the programs, you can run it on any geometry and any kind of device you want. Uh, it, it's uh, scriptable. Actually, there's a funny story. I mean, it, it's scriptable initially using Scheme, and recently we added on a, a Python interface, and you can also call it from C++ as well, so you can just write uh, you know, write basically write programs in any of those languages that that uh, 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 control the simulation and, and input any geometry you want and allow it to change as a function of time and extract any information you want from it. So it's quite quite flexible. So I have to ask the obvious question: Is is it scheme because of MIT? <laughs> no. So <laughs> the story the story here is uh, uh, um, you know before Meep came this. Other software, which still exists, uh, it's just more specialized, called MPB. And uh, so I, I was developing that in the back in the late '90s, actually at the same time as FGW. And at that time, uh, you know, most of the simulation codes that we had that were like these large Fortran codes that you have an input usually, and people who are Fortran users uh, will recognize this. Every time you ran a new simulation, you had to recompile the code because the parameters of the simulation were were put as like code parameters, and it had, or it had, or it had and or it had some um, inscrutable text file full of numbers and in the usual Fortran formats, they're usually space sensitive. Uh, that they had to, usually you had to write a script to write the input file for this this code. So I wanted to have uh, my program be scriptable, and. Uh, 
uh, at the time, you know, Python in, in like 1997 was still kind of a, you know, not completely on people's radar screen uh, for, comp for computational science. And the, uh, the, the GNU standard for scripting language add-on was Guile, which is, which is a scheme uh, implementation. And, and at the time, that was one of the ones that was one of the only languages that was really designed and documented uh, to be something that you would add on to a C program and, and use it to control that, that C program. Uh, you know, Python, as I said, you know, if, if, I, if I started a few years later, I probably would have, I probably would have used Python um, or Lua or something like, like that. But the, those la languages weren't really on, really on the radar screen at that time. I also, of course, knew Scheme because, because I'm at MIT and, you know, I took Scheme as an undergraduate and actually knew Scheme when I was in high school as well. So I was familiar and comfortable with the language. So I ended up using Guile and Scheme to script MPB and then... A few years later, in 2003, when we started working on MEEP, it was natural to use the same the, the same scripting tools I developed for Scheme for for controlling MPBs for, for sorry for controlling uh, MEEP as well. Uh, so that so that was the interface for many many years was the Scheme interface. Okay, so let me ask you about Python because Python is all the hotness these days. Um, how well does MEEP play with other Python numerical packages like NumPy and the like? So, so Python. So, so the, the Python interface is very fairly recent. Actually, there was a, another Python interface that was uh, done by another group uh, um, at Ghent University a few years ago. Uh, that, but we, we wanted something that was a little bit more closely integrated with uh, with uh, the core of MEEP. And so this this was uh, recently started. Uh, I guess uh, in the last year it was done. And then Chris Hogan, who's here as well, was the the lead on developing that. So yeah, it uses NumPy. It you know so for example, you can be running a MEEP simulation, and uh, at any point in time you can say, give me the fields uh, as a NumPy array, and then I want to or give a slice of the fields as a NumPy array, and then I can plot it with Matplotlib. Uh, and so you can use all of the Python tools. It uses it uses NumPy, uses um, H5Py, the 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 HDF5 Python interface. It uses it uses uh, the hooks in with the MPI uh, library. So you, so that the, so you can use Python's MPI tools to talk to uh, Meep's MPI uh, stuff. So it's 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 hooked in pretty well. So give us a little background here. How did Meep get started? Because if I read your web pages correctly, uh, this has been this is a, a fairly mature project, right? Yeah, it's been around since two thousand three was when it first got started, uh, and uh, it was actually started by David Roundy. Uh, as people may have heard of him, because he wrote something called the Darks version control system, uh, which was a you know a, a, a it, it came before Git. It was one of the early uh, distributed version control systems. It still exists. And he's currently a professor at, uh, at Oregon State. Uh, so he started this along with uh, uh, um, uh, a couple of colleagues of mine, Mihai Benescu uh, and Peter Bermel, who's now at, at Purdue. And I got involved uh, very shortly as well. Uh, so at the time, you know, basically in order to do research in electromagnetism, you have to have you know, you, you access to the codes, and every group had its own, you know, musty old Fortran code for doing the, this kind of simulation. And we were no exception. We, in fact, had two different Fortran codes. Uh, so David uh, started developing this. Actually, it was initially called Dactyl uh, for two-footed because it was only 2D and only cylindrical coordinates. And he started developing something that would handle cylindrical coordinates and be really... Uh, scriptable as a C++ library, and then it ended up being so so useful that he and 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 we started adding on full full you know support for other kinds of geometries, and and it became our main uh, our, our main time domain simulation code after that. Uh, so you mentioned that the uh, the code is open source, and that you were trying to bring you know these scalable you know cutting edge academic software to the commercial space and make it accessible. And that's part of the business around consulting and making it accessible, especially for small companies, utilizing the power of cloud while also supporting people's local systems. Uh, but the the licensing, I noticed, you know, FFTW, it, it says that, you know, you need to contact MIT if you want to get a commercial license for this. So 
can you clarify like what license is MEEP itself under and is it under a similar type of arrangement? So MEEP is also GPL. You know, the, the difference with FGW is that FGW is really only usable as a library. So if you want to use it in your in MATLAB or some other commercial code, uh, you, you have to, uh, and, and you don't want to open source your entire commercial code, then you have to buy a non-GPL license from MIT. So MEEP is also, you know, plus plus and uh, and Python and and so forth, but uh, um, so far people really haven't been integrating into like large commercial packages. You, you you control it with little scripts that you never distribute, so the license doesn't really prevent you from using that in a, in a commercial setting as is under the GPL because you know the GPL basically has no effect on you if you don't redistribute the code. So if if, if you just write a one-off script to use MEEP for your device, it has no effect on you. So that's that's not so 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 the commercial entities don't need a special license to use MPB so to use MEEP or MPB. Uh, so it, it, so Artivan's business model is not selling licenses. Uh, it, it's you know more selling consulting and other kinds of things. I, you know she can speak to more than I. One of the things that we're really focusing on here, as I mentioned, is to make uh, the simulations um, accessible to a much broader audience, and part of that involves offering the, the access to the tools through Amazon, particularly for companies who don't have their own local clusters. But another aspect of what we're working on right now is to make the tool easier to use. Um, one of the big challenges for, with engineering simulation tools is that they require typically a PhD level training to have confidence that the simulations are being set up correctly. And when the bar is set so high, it makes it very difficult for small companies, particularly startups, to really gain access to these kind of cutting edge technologies. And so the focus at Sympetus is really to try to make the tools much more accessible by automating the key functionality that requires uh, accurate simulation. So for example, choosing the right resolution in a MEEP simulation is non-trivial. Um, it depends very much on the materials that are involved and the structures that are being used. And so choosing the right resolution uh, has an enormous impact on the accuracy of the result. And so we're working on ways to essentially be able to automate choosing the right resolution for a given application in order to ensure confidence. And typically, uh, these involve a lot of trial and error and manual hand kind of tuning, uh, which we're developing tools to automate. Uh, the other aspect is actually running these simulations in the cloud. So for example, choosing a cluster that's sized for the application in order to ensure a very high throughput is also non-trivial. And so to really leverage the, the cloud, you want to choose a cluster configuration that's sized just for that application. And that's also a non-trivial kind of problem to deal with, particularly for new users who don't have experience. And so again, we're developing tools that can be used to leverage the cloud to deploy MEEP simulations in a way that's not possible today. And, and quite frankly, it's not possible with the other commercial solvers either. So what is it about MEEP? I mean, earlier uh, in our conversation, you mentioned that there's a lot of other software packages out there. And clearly, you're working to make it easy to use, make it available in a cloud-based environment, have consulting services and things like that. But what about the MEEP software itself? What makes it unique? Why, you know, other than licensing issues and whatnot, why would I use MEEP instead of uh, some of the other packages? One of the uh, key challenges with uh, finite difference time domain solvers in general is um, the representation of materials on the actual grid, the, vol the volumetric grid. And uh, in very early research that we did when we uh, were developing MEEP, we realized that the choice of the representation of these material geometries uh, is very much dependent on things like subpixel smoothing. Um, yeah, so, so, so basically, you know, these, these algorithms work by dividing space onto a grid. And so the question is, what do you do with the material that's at a boundary? Uh, you know, you have a pixel, basically. You're, you're just crossing the geometry into pixels. And what do you do with a pixel that crosses a boundary between two different materials? And how do you deal with that accurately? And so one of the things that it had early on was we developed a unique algorithm for, for doing a special kind of averaging uh, that makes it much more accurate 
uh, in handling boundaries. So, so, so it has some unique uh, accuracy features enabled in its ability to handle uh, uh, you know, discontinuous boundaries with high accuracy, for example. Why this is important is that this allows you to reduce the size considerably. So typically, in order to ensure very high accuracy, you really need to crank up the resolution. But with this subpixel averaging method that we developed, this allows you to reduce the size of the simulations while still ensuring accuracy. And this is particularly important for things like shape optimization, where you're varying the size or shape of your material geometry, and you're doing tens, maybe hundreds of calculations, and you want each simulation to be as small and as compact as possible because you're exploring a large parameter space, for example. And so this subpixel averaging really enables the application of MEEP to these problems that previously required lots of computational resources. Yeah, and, and another unique thing is just the scriptability, the ability to, to write, you know, call it as a C++ library or call from Python, hook into NumPy, you know, the, the level of integration that, that's possible there uh, is, 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 I think, relatively unusual, where you know, a lot of the focus, uh, especially in commercial codes, is typically on make, making nice GUI interfaces, which are also nice uh, for their own, you know, for certain audiences. Um, but especially in a research setting or in a design setting where you need to run lots and lots of different variations on a given design. It's really powerful to be able to program it. I, th I think we keep hearing one of your developers there in uh, the background as well. Yeah, my, <laughs> well, <laughs> my, one of my, well, my dog is in the background, so she comes with me in the, to the office a few days a week, and she's <laughs> a little restless at, uh, you know, not being, uh, not, not being able to play with me. <laughs> all right, well, let me ask you a question that I ask uh, all development projects on the podcast here is, uh, what version control system do you use and why? So initially we used Darks, and it was because uh, David Roundy started uh, started Meet, and he wrote the Darks version control system. And I used that for many years, uh, uh, and I actually like Darks a lot. I think it has a much better interface in many ways than Git. Um, but at some point, the advantage of uh, of being able to use GitHub, especially, was so overwhelming that we switched over. So I transferred all the history from Darks over to Git. There's nice nice tools that let you convert rep repositories one way or the other. Actually, that was a little tricky because we were using Darks so early on from such an early version that the Darks to Git migration tools didn't actually handle the early commits. So I had to patch it a little bit in order for that to work. So nowadays, it's all Git. It's on GitHub. We use the GitHub, you know, version tracking. We have the, you use the the Travis CI, all the usual uh, uh, all the usual tools that, that people use these days. Okay, so since uh, Meep is open source, I assume you have a bit of a community behind it. How do you guys accept uh, GitHub pull requests? You know, how does someone get involved in the Meep project? Yeah, so we do accept pull requests. Uh, I mean, you, the, the way you get involved is the way you normally get involved with something on GitHub. Uh, you know, you submit a pull request. You, usually, I would suggest uh, first filing. If you if you plan are planning a feature, first filing an issue, get some feedback on whether you know on the design of that feature, how it fit in with other plans. And once there's the green light, then go ahead and and submit a pull request uh, with with the code implementation. And uh, uh, yeah, most of the large Patches at this point is to have been done by people who work directly with me or and or Artivan, um, but uh, uh, you know the, 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 there's been smaller contributions and 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 there's now that we're on GitHub, which is actually a fairly, relatively recent thing in the last couple of years, uh, there's starting to be a wider community of people that are that are actually contributing directly patches and things, uh, whereas before. It was, you know, the, people could submit patches, of course, before with, even without GitHub. Uh, but it was, you know, much rarer, I think, for people to get involved that way. It, it, it's it's much easier now that there are all these nice online tools for tracking contributions. And where can people find uh, contact information for your new company? Uh, you can check out Sympetus.com. Sympetus is actually a reference to simulations being a impetus for new discoveries and technologies, S-I-M-P-E-T-U-S dot com. Okay, well, thank you very much, guys. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys.